I my work is on individualism and freedom in Chinese philosophy, and a lot of people would usually think that Chinese philosophy is collectivist in nature, and most people also think that Indian philosophy is mystical and ascetic. But with Charvaka and even with Nyaya, those two like are very interesting because it challenges the typical Orientalist mindset or monolithic views that some people might have about Asian philosophies. I'm Malcolm Keating, and you're listening to Sutras and Stuff. Today on the podcast, what connections does an expert in Chinese philosophy see between it and Indian philosophy? This episode is the third in a series of conversations with philosophers who have taught Indian philosophy at Yale and U.S. College in Singapore. It's an unusual liberal arts college where students first encounter philosophy through a global two-semester sequence, one which includes not just Indian philosophy, but also Chinese philosophy, Islamic philosophy, ancient Greek and Roman philosophy, and works from European traditions. Because this academic experiment is ending in 2025, I wanted to hear from professors who came to learn about Indian philosophy by teaching it in this global context. Most of them were experts in other areas of philosophy first. So, what did they learn from this experiment? Did it change their understanding of themselves, of philosophy, of the world? Hi,、uh, my name is Christine, and I do research on Chinese philosophy. Specifically on Neo Taoism. So, right now I'm working on a book that's going to talk about freedom in medieval China. In the background, you may hear Christine's cat, who really wanted to be part of the interview. Christine Tan is an expert in Chinese philosophy, in particular Guo Xiang, who is an early and important editor and commentator on the Zhuangzi. Christine has published journal articles on Chinese Buddhism, Confucianism, and Taoism, and her work focuses on questions about freedom, autonomy, and epistemology. My primary research is on Guo Xiang, who is a commentator of the Zhuangzi. So it's it's interesting to see how the same patterns of trying to fit. Early philosophical texts that were considered classics into current political context, and what their agenda was. So that's 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 something that that's fun to me. There are even some people who jokingly say that it is Guo Xiang who wrote the Zhuangzi and not not the other way around because he did compile it in such a way that. It is indeed, you know, easy for him to use it as as a medium for for what he thinks or what his philosophy is. So this is yet another connection between how Chinese philosophy, in at least in certain periods, is is commentarial in this way. That also is the case for Indian philosophy. Yeah, yeah. That those are really interesting、um, to me, and what that says about the attitudes in that tradition as well, because. When you, I think it's not that easy for Chinese philosophers, at least, to say that this is my philosophy, because people would then be like, "Well, who are you to do to to say that we should follow your philosophy?" One of the more interesting schools in Indian thought to me would probably be Charvaka, and I think that's probably interesting for me because it speaks to. My goals in my research. My work is on individualism and freedom in Chinese philosophy, and a lot of people would usually think that Chinese philosophy is collectivist in nature, and most people also think that Indian philosophy is mystical and ascetic. But with Charvaka and even with Nyaya, those two like are very interesting because it challenges the typical Orientalist mindset. Or monolithic views that some people might have about Asian philosophies. A note: Charvaka is the name for a group of traditions usually characterized as materialist and sometimes skeptical. You'll also hear the term Lokayata used for them. Now, since winners tend to write history, we don't actually have Charvaka writings, mostly just their words being quoted and then criticized by other Indian philosophers. They seem to have argued against inductive reasoning as a way of knowing. 
they took perception as the only really firm ground for knowledge. And probably because of this claim, they were skeptical about other claims, like that ritual activity could lead to heaven, or that there is some eternal self that was reborn into different bodies. We see a Charvaka philosopher in Jayantabhatta's play, which I talked about last season. A note, Charvaka is the name for a group of traditions usually characterized as materialist and sometimes skeptical. You'll also hear the term Lokayata used for them. Now, since winners tend to write history, we don't actually have Charvaka writings, mostly, just their words being quoted and then criticized by other Indian philosophers. They seem to have argued against inductive reasoning as a way of knowing. They took perception as the only really firm ground for knowledge. And probably because of this claim, they were skeptical about other claims, like that ritual activity could lead to heaven, or that there is some eternal self that was reborn into different bodies. We see a Charvaka philosopher in Jayantabhatta's play, which I talked about last season. The Charvaka philosopher tries to convince the king to stop supporting any of the religious groups, Vedic or otherwise, because he thinks it's a waste of the king's money. Now, back to the connection Christine sees between Indian philosophy and her work in Chinese philosophy. Yeah, so when I talk about when I talk about these things to people who aren't familiar with Asian philosophy, they're usually surprised and I think about I think about my work as mostly really gearing towards Anglophone scholarship. So kind of interpreting Chinese philosophy and bringing it out and kind of showing Anglophone scholarship on why we should pay attention to these non-mainstream philosophies. And I think you kind of see that very clearly in schools in, in Indian philosophies like Nyaya and Charvaka because it challenges what they think they already know. So it kind of gives the message of, oh, actually, there is something that is pretty interesting there that I don't know, and I might, I should probably check out. I asked her if this is similar in Chinese philosophy. I think there there are. Um, there are quite materialist thoughts, but I wouldn't say that it, it's in the same vein as the, as the Travak, of course, because, you know, the problems were different, the context, the context was different, the issues that they were grappling with were quite different as well. But definitely the something refreshing that's similar as well is the absence of what one anthropomorphized God. And that's, that's quite interesting to me about how they think about metaphysics in this way. One other debate or dominant debate during the Neo-Taoism was being and non-being. And during the time, people were debating whether non-being came first or being came first. And Guo Xiang was saying that actually, no, this is a dialectical relationship. So he did deny because there the first, some transcendental first cause is probably the right way to say it, but that transcendental first cause is not anthropocentric as is, as is, as it is in the Western, in Western philosophy. So it's mostly nothingness, like did the world come from like a pure lack or pure nothing? And he, like he just came in and said that uh, no, there's really not a time when you could say that there was nothing, nothing. And that, I think, well, that, that is, that is a long way to, to, uh, freedom and individualism. But I also really find it interesting how that connects to Buddhism as well with regard to, like, the pure lack. And then later on, when you have, you know, in the Chan Zen tradition, uh, that, the complete removal of that pure nothingness and saying you know, these things like there is no mirror at all, right? So that's also really interesting with the connections of Guo Xiang to Chan Buddhism. Your work on um, Guo Xiang's uh, ideas of individualism and freedom, another thing that you, you said that I wanted to pick up on was that a lot of people, well, many people, let's say, I don't know, <laughs> uh, think that Chinese thought, quotes here, right, like there's not a monolithic thing, is uh, sort of collectivist. 
and um, maybe maybe even determinist or sort of uh, constrained in these ways. But you are looking at a thinker who you characterize as um, being concerned with individualism and freedom. How how does that work out in Guoxiang's work? Yeah, I think that's where the lack of a single being with that kind of where we sort of inherit that transcendent free will from is what affects the, that notion of freedom, that it's not a transcendent will as you see sometimes in the West, but also the idea that causality is something, there's no such thing as linear causality and it's a radical kind of intercausality presents us with a different kind of individualism that just because it's not the same with a transcendent will doesn't mean that it's not it cannot be concerned with the individual but at the same time there's also not one ideology that encompasses everything there because there is no one one thing that can um, take everything under its umbrella and is this connected to, for instance, Zhuangzi's perspectivism, that there's different – well, I guess I guess it depends on whether you take his perspectivism to be about our access to the world or, or what, but um, that there's, there's different ways of being for, for different creatures. Is that something along those lines? Yeah, definitely. I think Zhuangzi really did give him a medium to talk about his philosophy, but – at the same time, just as with any commentary, right? Like the commentator is a different voice in, in it or in himself. Yeah, I saw again in this little article that I looked at, uh, he was talking about um, a place where the Zhuangzi was characterizing a sage coming to talk to a king. And there's some discussion in the text about whether the sage or the king should be the ruler. And I think it was something like Guo Xiong saying, well, don't think you have to be sitting on a mountaintop doing nothing in order to 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 en- en- enact Wu. That that you can do this in the realm of action as well. I thought that was pretty interesting. What do you make of that section? I, I probably botched it. So how how would you characterize what's going on there? Yeah. So that's one of the most famous lines from Guo Xiang, and he's saying that in order for you to be a sage. You are a sage whether you're in the mountain or in the in the imperial halls. And I think that is indeed one of the interesting things because at the end of the day, their goal was was political, or at least I think so, mm-hmm. that the motivations were re- were inherently political. So what he wants to say is that, okay, so what we've done so far hasn't worked. So because we stick to one set of fixed set of things, which is very Zhuangzi, right? That we need to change the way that we see things and therefore the way that we rule as well. The way that policies are executed. And I think that for Guoxiang, because of this very radical intercausality, there's a lot of room for a bottom-up approach at the time. And it speaks to his to his life as well, because at the time there were noblemen were usually the ones who were rulers. But Guoxiang is kind of like a rags to riches story where he wasn't a noble, wasn't from a noble family, but then he rose. Probably part of it is trying to kind of defend or convince, yeah, defend his place in the court. Hmm. So... Would you say then that in terms of things like ritual, Confucian ritual, um, what was his attitude towards the the role of ritual in human society? I'm just thinking back to, again, connections with Indian philosophy and thinking about people like like Charvaka philosophers who might say, "Look, this this is a kind of a big scam. It's a it's a way to to spend money, and there's not really any evidence that there's there are these um, that there's heaven or gods or things like this." And um, that sounds a little maybe maybe Moist, but um, I'm also wondering if what Guo, what Guo Shang would say about that. Disagree, agree. <laughs> if we're just looking at Zhuangzi, he would definitely agree with that. You know, like, what's the point of doing that when we're just dust to dust? 
But for Guo Xiang, it's a little bit more complicated because he does recognize the importance or need of that in in society, and how it cultivates a certain kind of belonging or a certain kind of temperament. But he, I think, the only thing is that he would emphasize on the need of those rituals to also change, that they should have different purposes for different. Times. So he's really concerned then with the implications of his his work for the current moment and the political rule. He's he's not con- he's not content to just let metaphysics be a sort of abstract set of ideas. Yeah, and I think just as uh, in much of Buddhism as well, the main the main enemy rather is ideology. You know, it's like they don't want to have this kind of fix. Idea or set of values that they know is going to betray them later on, which is very reminiscent to me of the koan. If you see the Buddha, kill him. Hmm, yeah, that's very, that's interesting. Well, well, great. Well, thank you again, Christine, for your time. I really appreciate you talking with me. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 